Hi, and welcome to part two of this lecture. In this part, we're going to talk about storage elements, particularly latches and flip-flops. And the key concept here is the idea of memory, the idea of being able to keep an output in a certain state once it's been set, and then to be able to reset it to a known state. So first of all, we'll talk about latches, and the latch is the basis of the flip-flop. So understanding the concept of the latch is very important in order to understand the functionality of the flip-flop. And you'll probably find that once you understand the latch, then the extension to the flip-flop is relatively easy. So this basic NOR SR latch contains two NOR gates here and here, and they're connected in such a way that the output from one of the NOR gates becomes the input to the other NOR gate, and then the second NOR gate's output becomes the input to the first NOR gate. And this has some interesting properties that we can exploit in order for us to have a set or a reset signal coming in, and then for that signal to be maintained on the outputs. Notice here with the outputs, we've got a Q and a Q inverted. So obviously these can only take binary states where one of the outputs is a one, then the other one will be a zero and then vice versa. So let's have a look at this time sequence behavior from this table down here where time is going down ways. And initially both the output Q and Q naught is in an unknown state and we'll say that set and reset are both zeros. Now, if we have a one coming in on the set, then this sets the Q to equal to be one and the Q naught to be equal to zero. And then once that set pulse goes back to zero, we still find that we've remembered Q. So we've using this storage element to store the state of set in Q. It remembers one. Now, if we get a pulse on the reset coming in, whilst set is zero, then we have Q going to zero and Q not going to one. And so now Q is remembering zero. Q stays in zero whilst reset is zero and whilst set is zero. One thing also to notice is these zero zeros where both reset and set are zero can have different outputs for Q. Notice how we had it being unknown to start off with, one for Q here and then zero for Q here. Now, if both reset and set have a pulse going in at the same time or a one at the same time, then the problem is both Q and Q inverted will both go to zero. And you can see that this is problematic because it can't be that both of these are zero. So having both Q and Q inverted being zero, which mind you is in an erroneous state or a problematic state, which we should never attempt to get to, then when both reset and set become zero again, then what happens is we have a zero here and a zero here. Zero nor zero gives a one, and then we get a one nor zero, because remembering for a nor gate, simply being the inversion of an or gate, the truth table is zero zero gives one, zero one gives zero, one zero gives zero, one one gives zero. Therefore, if we have two zeros in, we get a one. And then if we have a one and a zero, we get a zero. And that seems to be okay. It looks like we've got Q being one and Q naught being zero. However, if we start our analysis with the top one, so remove these and we say that Q is zero, then this is zero. And then all of a sudden Q inverted is one. And then one going in here gives zero. So this is completely confusing because it seems depending upon if we start analyzing the circuit from the Q or from the Q invert, then we get a different result coming out the end. It's almost like Q can be zero or one and Q inverted can be zero or one, which is obviously not something that we want. But there are some useful properties in this middle section where we're able to use set and reset. And as long as we don't go into this, both set and reset being one at the same time for the NOR SR latch, then that's a useful way of storing the state. And you can remember both the good part of this table and also the bad part because later Later on, we're going to work out ways to remove this, to remove the chances of becoming unstable, but to maintain this memory idea. So here's a NAND SR latch, often denoted with complement symbols above the S and the R. 
And so these cross-coupled NAND gates, different to the last one, we had two NOR gates. Now we have two NAND gates here and here, but once again, they're cross-coupled. For this NAND SR latch, let's have a look at the table. And you'll notice that it's very similar to the NOR SR latch. Wherever we had zeros before, now we have ones, both reset and set start with a value of one where the Q and the Q naught is unknown and then set changes from high to low. And now Q is set to one and Q inversion is set to zero. Now once set changes back to one, then we have this memory condition again where Q remembers one. Q stays at one and Q inverted stays at zero despite the fact that both set and reset are just one. And then if reset goes down to zero, then we have Q being set to zero. We change this to zero and change Q inverted to one. And now Q is remembering zero. Similar to before, we have both reset and set being in the same state of one, one, and then that being this memory state. And then similar to before, where we were trying to avoid having one, one, in this case for the NAND SR latch, we have to avoid zero, zero, because in the case of zero, zero, both the outputs will go high. And then once they both change back to 1,1, one, one, depending upon where we analyze the circuit from, whether we analyze it from the bottom here and say this is 1,1, one, one, therefore due to the truth table of the NAND gate, where we have 0,0, zero giving 1, 0,1 zero, one, giving 1, 1,0 one, giving 1, and 1,1 one, one, giving 0. If we analyze from the bottom, we have 1,1, one, one, we get 0, and then 0,1, zero, we get 1. However, if we analyzed from the top, so remove these, and we said Q is equal to one, and then we had one, one giving zero, one, zero giving one. Therefore, Q in that case is both zero and one, and Q invert is both one and zero, so unstable. So as before, we have these patterns to avoid. In this case, it's S equaling zero, R equaling zero, before it was S and R both being one. But these are the basics for the NAND latch, and it does allow for these memory conditions in the center here whilst also having the drawbacks of the possibility of going into an unstable state. In the first part of this lecture, we talked about the synchronous circuit where we included a clock. And by including this clock here, we're able to have this SR latch, which functions very similarly to the SR NAND latch, except that S and R inputs only observed when the line C is high. That is when we get a clock pulse going into the clock. Now you'll notice from before we had this structure, this was the SR NAND latch, and by adding two more NAND gates, one, two, and also this clock input, then we have what's called a clocked SR latch. So as I said, it has the same behavior as the SR latch. Of course, C means control or clock, as you think about it as clock. Now here's the table of what the clocked SR latch looks like. And notice for this synchronous circuit that the state of the outputs Q and Q inverted depend upon SR and C, but also upon the state that it was in previously. Hence we get the idea of sequence. This truth table shows the possible values of Q at time T, set and reset, and then basically what would be the next state, which is Q at time T plus one. When the state at time t is zero and set and reset is zero, then the next state is also zero. When the state is zero, set is zero and reset is one, then we get what's called clearing of Q. And clearing of Q really just means setting Q to be zero, but it means that the next state, Qt plus one, is zero, which happens to be the same as the current state. And this is no matter what the previous state is, remembering that this is not necessarily happening in a sequence order. It is not happening like this. It's a table to show given a certain state and a certain input S and a certain input R, what is the next state along. If the current state is zero and we have a set being high and a reset being low, then it's like we're setting Q, means setting Q to be one, Q T plus one is one. And from the table on the NAND SR latch page, we know that these ones are not allowed, no matter whether we have the current state being zero or the current state being one, then we basically have this indeterminate state occurring here. In the case where the state at time t is one, and then we have set and reset being zero, we have no change. Notice here that we had zero, set and reset being zero, we have no change, so it's the same. Qt plus one equals Qt. 
if we get a reset pulse and the previous state was one, then it becomes zero. Before, when it was zero and we got a reset pulse, it stayed at zero. And finally, if the state is one and we get a set pulse, reset is zero, then in this case, it stays at one, but it's setting Q. So it's making sure that Q is one, where before the state changed from zero to one. Understanding the functionality of the D-latch and later on the D flip-flops will enable you to answer a significant number of the sequential logic circuit questions. So we have our initial SR NAND latch here, then we've added the clock in and our, our two the only addition is this inverter. The other big difference, of course, is that instead of having what we had before of S and R, where we had two inputs, now we just have the single input D, and this makes sure that there are no indeterminate states, since we have the inversion of D at the bottom going into the reset, and we have set at the top. Make sure they can't be one at the same time. Now let's look at the state table here. We have the possible values of Q and the possible values of D, and then we have what happens in the next state. Current state being zero, D input being zero, means that we have no change. Zero and one, sets the next state to be one. Current state one, D input of zero clears Q to zero, and then current state one, D equaling one, there's no change, it stays at one. The other thing to notice, which is not shown in this table, of course, is that there's a clock coming in and things are only happening when the clock is high. This is the graphical symbol for the D latch, and you'll probably see this quite often from now on. Okay, so it may seem that we've actually solved the problem of instability by using the D-latch. However, there is still one problem, and it's a problem that we're going to call the latch timing problem. And the way to solve this latch timing problem is going to be the use of flip-flops. We'll get to that later. So the latch timing problem requires us to understand a few more concepts about the sequential circuit. In the sequential circuit, there could be a path that exists through the combinational logic from one storage element to another. That would be where we have a D latch and we have a clock. We have the output being Q. And in this way, we have one D latch connected to another D latch. It can also be that we have a storage element connected back to the same storage element. That would look like this. And whilst we may have a combinational logic, and I'll put this inverted commas because even something as simple as this wire connection between the output Q and the input D could be considered as a combinational logic circuit. And this is to say that it could be as simple as an interconnect, as simple as just a wire or as simple as a connection between those without any gates in between. The other thing to realize is for a clocked D latch, the output Q depends upon the input D. Whenever the input clock C has a value of one, that is when we get a pulse of one. That means at these times, but not at the other times. So let's consider the following circuit. The same as I had on the previous page, we have the input D being the inversion of the output Q and we have a clock input. So suppose that initially Y is equal to zero, that is the connection here is zero, the output of the inverter gate is one, then the input to D is one. Then when we have a clock pulse, we see that the Y actually changes state from one to zero and one to zero during that clock pulse. And that means that whilst the clock is one, that is in this period here, then Y continues to change. But this is not really what we want, we really want only to happen once per clock pulse. The reason why we're getting some changes is due to the delay present in the loop through the connector from Y back to Y. That is, it takes some time for a signal to propagate all the way around here through the inverter gate and then through this D latch to get to Y. And whilst that's happening, then we're getting this fluctuation, this change 1010 for the output Y, which is clearly unacceptable. What we want is for Y to change only once, only once per clock pulse. A way to solve this latch timing problem is to break the closed path from Y to Y within the storage element. That is, whilst there's a clock tick of one, then we make sure that we only worry about things that happen either on the rising edge or the falling edge of the clock. Not, not in here, not during that one. The way we would provide this path breaking solution is to replace this clock D latch, which we talked about previously, with a master slave flip flop, waits for one complete clock pulse, or an edge triggered flip flop, which waits for an edge, either a rising edge or a falling edge. The SR master slave flip flop is shown here, and it consists of two clocked SR latches, one, two both of them which have clock inputs. But notice here that this second latch is like an inverted version of this clock. So when this clock is zero, 
one, zero, then this one's going to be seeing one, zero, one. The input is observed by the first latch by this guy when the clock pulse is one, that is here. And then the output is changed by the second latch with the clock pulse of zero. But while this first latch is observing the inputs whilst the clock is high, then the output Q and Q invert is being ignored because all the time the clock value here is zero. Because we have a value of zero here, then the second latch is not taking any inputs. So it's essentially storing in one and it's waiting waiting until this clock goes from one back to zero before this one will go from zero to one and actually the output will be observed by the second latch. And in this way, the behavior that was demonstrated by the example where the output Y was coming into the D is prevented because the clock must change from one to zero before a change in Y based on D can occur. So although we don't have any Ds and Ys in this, you have to imagine that the D was the input to all of this and the Y was the output. But even if there's an interconnection between this Q all the way back to this S, the fact that we can't get a propagation from latch one to latch two until we get a clock change from one to zero shows how this SR master slave flip-flop arrangement solves the latch timing problem. But you may notice now that Although we've solved one problem, we've actually ended up slowing down the circuit because the flip-flop output is delayed by this pulse width, as in the clock pulse width. This makes the circuit slower. If S and R are permitted to change while the clock is one, and we suppose that Q is equal to zero, S goes to one and back to zero. So we have a, a nice pulse for S going from goes to one, goes from zero to one, and then back to zero, with R remaining at zero. Then the master latch is set to one, and a one is transferred to the slave. And the other case is, suppose that Q is zero, same as before, and that S goes to one and back to zero, and R also goes to one and back to zero. Then the master latch sets and then resets, and a zero is transferred to the slave in this case. In the first case, it was a one transferred to the slave. In the second case, it was a zero. This is called ones catching. The solution to this flip-flop problem is to use edge triggering instead of master-slave flip-flop. An edge triggering flip-flop ignores the pulse while it's at a constant level and triggers only during the transition of the clock signal. So I did briefly mention it before, but we say that whilst the clock signal is the same value, nothing's happening. It's when there's a change like this. This is rising and then this is going constantly for a while and then this is falling. So it's at this point of change from zero going to one or from one going down to zero. This edge triggering flip-flop, as the name indicates, triggers on an edge. And we call this an edge, and we call this an edge, and that's the triggering. We can build the edge triggering flip-flops directly at the circuit level, or we can have a master-slave D flip-flop, which also exhibits the edge-triggered behavior. The edge-triggered D flip-flop is the same as the master-slave D flip-flop, and it can be formed by replacing what we had before, where we had a, an SR latch here. We replace that with a clocked D latch, as we have here, the D input and the, the clock, or by adding a D input and an inverter to the master-slave SR flip-flop. The delay issue that we were talking about before in the master-slave SR flip-flop can be avoided since the ones catching behavior isn't present with the D replacing the S and R inputs. The change of the D flip-flop output is associated with a negative edge at the end of the pulse where it actually starts to go negative. And this is called a negative edge triggered flip-flop. In a positive edge triggered flip-flop, the difference is the addition of this inversion gate here to the clock. And in this way, the Q changes to the value on D applied at the positive edge within timing constraints to be specified. That is where we change to a positive from zero. The positive edge triggered flip-flop is the standard flip-flop choice for most of our sequential circuits. So this is the one that you should most understand, but it's a good idea to understand the difference between the positive edge triggered and the negative edge triggered, and also how the use of these flip-flops can solve both the latch timing problem and also the ones catching issues with the SR master slave flip-flop. Here are some of the symbols that you may see. So there's the SR latches, the SR latches with the inversions on the inputs, a D latch with a, a one control, a D latch with a zero control. So these are the master slave flip-flops, the flip-flop that's triggered on the up then down, and then this is the down up triggered, 
SR flip-flop and then the same for the D master slave flip-flops there. And right at the bottom here in C is the edge triggered flip-flops. This one being the positive edged and this one being the negative edge triggered D flip-flops. At power up or reset then we make sure that all parts of the sequential circuit are initialized to a known state before we begin operation. So we have to get it into a known state because initially the cues are unknown and this initialization is often done outside of the clocked behavior of the circuit that is asynchronously not using the clock and we use what's called direct R as in reset and or S set inputs that these can control the state of the latches within the flip-flops used at initialization time and so for example in the flip-flop that's shown in this picture we have the the s and the r as additional inputs here a zero applied to the r if we put in a zero here then it resets the flip-flop to a zero state whilst a zero applied here resets the flip-flop to a one state okay that's the end of the storage elements part of this lecture in the next part we're going to be talking about state tables and state diagrams actually show how we can analyze these sequential circuits and give you some tools to do that with which is the tables and the state diagrams so i'll see you then